Hello everybody. Last time that I came to you, I was talking a little bit about some of the changes that I saw coming with Go 1.6 that I wanted to share with you. Specifically, I was talking about the templates package and how block actions were going to be added. And some very exciting things, especially when combined with the ability to redefine templates. Well, today I'd like to talk about something else that's coming to Go in 1.6. It's actually been around for a little while, but it's finally being baked in, and that's the introduction of HTTP2 as the default transport protocol when communicating over secure connections with web applications. Before we get into too many of the details, let's talk a little bit about where HTTP came from and how it's gotten to where it's going and why we need HTTP2 at all. So HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and the term hypertext was first coined in about 1965 and it was an homage to the term memex, which is a concept of shared memory, such as all humans could share memory and we instantly have access to what everybody else knows. Really a precursor to the concept that we see being fulfilled in the internet today. That term was created by a guy named Vannevar Bush in his paper, As We May Think, dated back in 1945. Well, of course, we didn't have HTTP back then, but fast forward a few years to 1991, and version 0.9 of the HTTP protocol came out. Now this, when it was first envisioned, it was thought of as a way to transmit text documents across connected networks. So we see that reflected in the specification and a lot of that legacy that we see created right here in 1991 is some of the issues that HTTP2 is trying to address based on how much the uses of HTTP has changed over time. So it was TCP based, we still see that today. So there was a TCP connection established for every message that was sent. It was an ASCII protocol. So there was no Unicode. There was no binary transfer of data. Everything had to be transferred as an ASCII character across this. If you think about that today, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But back in that time, when the concept of these documents that were being transferred was just text documents back and forth across the network, ASCII really made sense. It was a reasonable protocol at the time. Nobody was thinking about transferring images across a network when this was created. It was a single line request. There were no headers. You simply had the method that you were creating. So get, which we'll see, that was the only method available, and the path to the resource that you were requesting. There was no way to describe anything else. Sequential requests. So when you made a request across with HTTP version 0.9, it was a single request at a time. One request had to be sent and filled, then the next request had to be made. Again, that's kind of silly in today's thought, but at the time when it was a document-based protocol, it made a lot of sense that there would be one document. You wouldn't need to worry about more than one document being sent at a time. Also, there was only one method defined, the get method. There was no concept of pushing data back onto the server. It was simply you ask for a resource and that resource was retrieved to you. Fast forward a little bit to 1996, and the version 0.9 of the protocol was standardized under HTTP 1 with RFC 1945. So at the same time, they basically tried to codify what was in the 0.9 version of the spec. There were some additional changes that were made. Headers were added. So this is where content type and things like that were finally added into the protocol in order to provide a capability to describe what was being sent since there was a recognition at this point that people wanted to send more than just plain text documents across the network. Status codes were added. Of course, this is a logical follow-on to headers but the status codes could actually have the server communicate back to the requester the success or failure or what happened with that request. Also, two methods were added, post and head, so we could finally send data back to the server in 1996 with the post method, and of course the head method would allow us to get a little bit of information about the resource without actually downloading the resource itself. Very quickly after HTTP 1 came out, HTTP 1.1 came out there was almost an immediate recognition that there was a flaw in 1.0 that had to be addressed. So that was the reuse of the TCP connection. As I mentioned, in version 0.9, there was one TCP connection, one TCP handshake per document that was sent. With 1.1, TCP connections could be reused. They weren't long-lived, but they could live through multiple request response sessions. The servers were allowed to do that in order to make more efficient use of the network resources. Additionally, there were now eight methods that were available. So in addition to get, post, and head, things like put and delete were added, along with a couple other methods that we now know of and expect to be in the specification. 
a long time passed where 1.1 has been the protocol that we could use. It wasn't until the middle of this year that a new version of the specification was released. It's trying to address some of the issues that have come up over the intervening almost two decades between version 1.1 of the spec and what the internet has truly become. So the first thing is, instead of a long-lived TCP connection, we have a single TCP connection. So a very long-lived TCP connection. The intention is that for most conversations, the client and server will establish one TCP connection and keep that connection open for the lifetime of the communication between that client and the server. There are circumstances where that has to be changed, but those are normally very, very, very long-running connections. Also, the ASCII protocol was finally removed, and everything has been moved over to binary. Binary makes it more scalable. As we've seen with computers, you can represent anything in binary, so it allows a lot of flexibility. Apparently, it also provides a lot of coding and efficiency improvements on the server side, since binary is typically an easier protocol to work with than ASCII. It is fully multiplexed. Now, this is a logical outflow of having a single TCP connection. How are you going to send multiple request responses? Well, instead of them being sequential, like we had in version 1 of HTTP, those are now multiplexed through that connection. So we'll see a concept called streams. Streams are what contain those request response cycles. Every stream has its own ID. So when information is sent on a stream, it has that ID on it so that the receiver of that information knows how to associate that with what it's already received and reassemble it. Header compression. So HTTP2 was based on a lot of the fundamental research was done with Google's attempt at a new protocol called Speedy, SPDY. What Speedy really focused on was this concept of compressing headers. It used an off-the-shelf technology, the deflate protocol, to do that. With HTTP2, we now have a purpose-built protocol called HPAC that is specifically designed to compress HTTP headers into the smallest possible representation. Finally, we have some new features. While HTTP2 is by and large intended to be a drop-in replacement for version 1.1 of the spec, there are some new features that are being added in order to continue to increase the responsiveness and efficiency of use of network resources. So server-side push is the concept of if I create a single-page web application, very often the client will start by navigating to the root of my site. Up till now, even if the server knows that the client is going to have to ask for the JavaScript application, that single page application, as well as CSS libraries and images, it had to wait for that to be requested in order to respond. With server push, the server can now anticipate that demand, start pushing the resources down onto that client, and then when the client does get around to asking for it, the data is already most of the way there. So it's a much faster experience for the user, much more efficient use of their time, as well as network resources. So what does the structure of HTTP look like? We don't have these individual request response cycles anymore, so we have to understand how is this information being transmitted between the client and the server. Well, we're going to start with this one monolithic connection. Again, the intention is that this connection lasts through the entire life cycle of imagine a page. So if we were navigating through a website, we went to the home page, that would be one TCP connection. If we navigated from the home page to the about page, that would probably trigger the creation of another connection. Within that connection, the multiplexing is handled by what are called streams. These streams are the individual request response cycles. So whenever the client or the server need to send some information to each other, or whenever they need to send information between one another, they'll create a stream, use that stream to send the information, and then that stream will be closed. Each one of those streams represents one conversation that they're having. And of course, with the multiplexing, more than one conversation can be had at one time. The way those conversations are had is a little bit different than HTTP 1.1 as well. In HTTP 1.1, basically the whole document was sent as one thing. Now TCP would break it up a little bit. So starting with the get slash HTTP slash 1.1, followed by the headers, followed by the body, would be represented as one single document that got sent. And again, the TCP protocol was responsible for chunking that out and sending that across. In HTTP 2, that responsibility has been elevated up to the protocol, up to the HTTP protocol level, and it uses a concept called frames. Now, instead of everything being one ASCII document being sent around, these frames are purpose-built. 
So if you're sending headers, there is a type of frame called a headers frame that is specifically designed to handle header information. If you're sending data, so for example, if you're downloading an image from the server to the client, there are data frames that are specifically designed to contain that binary information. There's actually quite a few other frames. I'm not going to be able to get into that in this discussion, but I would encourage you, if you're interested, go ahead and go out there and read the specs. There's a lot to learn about it. So within this context, if we don't have individual TCP connections and we have this concept of streams, what does an HTTP message lifecycle look like? So I want you to imagine that we're operating within a stream. So the way we're going to start is a headers request is going to come from the client to the server. This will initiate the creation of the stream so the client will request a new stream to be created. Along that stream will be this first headers frame that will actually make the request to the server. The server will send back a headers frame as well, and imagine that this is the response headers that you would normally send. Additionally, and I guess the client can send these too, there can be what are called continuation frames. So if not all of the headers will fit in the headers frame, additional continuation frames can be added. All of the continuation frames plus the headers frame would be considered the header of the response. After that, zero or more data frames can be sent, and that'll contain the body of the response. Finally, a little bit strange name here, but there can be trailing headers sent after the data. And along with those headers can be additional continuation frames. So as you can see, it's pretty much the same life cycle as an HTTP 1.1 message, but now we've got these frames being sent across instead of single documents being chunked out by TCP. And by doing that, for example, header compression is much easier with this because all we need to do is compress headers and continuation frames. The data frames don't have to care about header compression at all. So the protocols can be more targeted. We can specialize the individual frames to do the best job at what they are specifically being tasked to accomplish. Okay. So that's what I want to talk about. There's a lot more theory behind HTTP2. I don't really want to stick around any longer with that. Uh, I am putting together a Pluralsight course, so if you are curious about that, feel free to hit me up with a message. That course should be out in a couple of months after I get things rolling with producing it. But for now, let's get into some code and let's compare what an HTTP 1.1 versus an HTTP 2 application actually looks like. So what I want to do with this section is I want to actually show what a non-trivial application looks like when you're sending it across HTTP2 versus HTTP 1.1. So what I've decided, if you look in this public folder, I've got a lot of files here, and I did not make these files, I stole these files from the Aurelia.io website. Now Aurelia is one of the next generation JavaScript frameworks. The only reason I picked it is because I know that it's got a non-trivial Hello World tutorial, at least from a network traffic standpoint. And so I wanted to demonstrate using that. So if I click get started, I can get these get set up. And these are zip files that contain a bunch of assets that you can use in order to get your Aurelia application up and running. I don't really care about Aurelia in this demo. It's just something that I've been researching on the side and I know that it's pretty heavy on the network requests. So I thought it made a pretty good simple benchmark on how HTTP 1 versus HTTP 2 are gonna work. So one thing we have to worry about first, HTTP2 is not supported by many browsers on insecure connections. I think that this is one way that the browser vendors are pushing the industry more towards secure connections. So we're going to have to actually be able to create secure connections. To do that, I need a couple of certs. If you're not aware of this, this is a good piece of information to know about. If I go to the crypto package and the TLS sub package, there is a file called generatecert.go. If you need to create self-signed certs to test out secure web applications, this is a very nice tool to use. So if I run that with the dash help flags, wait for it to compile and generate the help information, you see here there are quite a few flags that I can set in order to determine the life of the cert and things like that. I am going to run this with the host equals localhost and let's set that to running. And it generates two files, the certification and a key file. So I'm then going to copy those into my source code root folder. Okay, they're there. So now that I have those, I'm gonna be able to use 
the TLS connections, the TLS listeners in order to create those. So I want to be able to create two web applications side by side. So I can't create two executables in the same place. So I'm going to create a subfolder called HTTP. And we'll use this to create the HTTP 1.1 listener. So I am running, just so you are able to keep following along with me. Get back here. I'm running version 1.5.2 of Go. If I use version 1.6, this won't work because HTTP2 is the default protocol. There is no way to get it to not do it that I am aware of. So with Go 1.5, I can actually do an A-B comparison of the two versions of the HTTP protocol. So that's why I'm using this. So inside of this guy, I'm going to create this as a main entry point. I'm going to import the net HTTP, create the main function, and then I will set up a handler as a simple file server that is going to point to the public folder. And then I'll spin this up with the listen and serve TLS, give it the port, 3000, the cert, and the key file. And then I'll use the default server mux so I don't have to pass anything there. So what this is going to do, the intention, this demo comes with an index.html that bootstraps the Aurelia framework. It's going to make about 300 HTTP requests in order to actually do that because this is a development and it's the first tutorial. So there's some things that they have in here that they don't actually need for Aurelia. It's just to demonstrate the use of the kind of a hello world for Aurelia. So it'll be a nice way to see how do we handle 300 requests for JavaScript resources at the same time. So now that that's done, I want to create another folder that'll do the same job, but we're going to use HTTP to do that. Okay, it's another main. I'm going to import two packages this time, net HTTP, and then there's a package on Golang .org. It's a subrepository, so it's prefixed with X. That's the HTTP package. I believe that this is going to continue to be maintained. This package is actually, as I understand it by reading the source code, this is what they bundled up in order to create the HTTP2 package. They bundled this right into the net HTTP package, and that is where the source files for HTTP servers came in. So if you are curious, this is out here on Golang. Me. A lot of this API is documented, typical of any other Go library. You will not be able to access a lot of this functionality in Go 1.6 from the net HTTP package. You're going to have to continue to import this and build your own server similar to how I'm about to build this one. Okay, so I need a main function. Within this main function, I'm going to create a server. And this is going to be a regular old HTTP package server. And I'm also going to create an HTTP server, but I'm going to call it a configuration because it's not actually a server. It's the configuration of the HTTP2 server that I'm going to kind of mix into the HTTP server in order to make this work. So the way you do this is there's a configure server function on the package that takes, you see it takes an HTTP server and an HTTP2 server. That's why I created those. So we pass those in. Before we go any further, let me just show you what's on this. There's no methods, it just contains properties. So these properties are going to be used by the configure server function in order to understand how to configure the server here. So the way this works under the covers, I haven't dug too deeply. What it's going to do is create another TLS handler. And that handler is what's actually going to implement the HTTP2 protocol. So instead of defaulting to the HTTP1 handler that it would normally do, it's going to register to handle messages with the HTTP2 protocol. Okay, so we're almost done here. There's actually not that much that has to be done. Uh, then I'm going to create the handle just like I did with the HTTP 1.1 example. I'm going to create the handle. Pass in the root directory. 
set the port on the server to be different than the other instance. And then I'll set this to listen and serve, passing in the cert and the key. Okay, make sure that is happy. That looks good. So let's fire these up. So I'm going to build source HTTP and run it. And I'm going to spin up another terminal. Do the same thing. Okay, those are both running. So I should be able to do this. Rip this off and center over here. So I have to remember these are secure connections, so I have to use HTTPS. Hopefully that works, that one works. Do HTTP2 over here. And that one works as well. Okay, so let's see what we can see by opening up the consoles here. So I'm gonna empty cache and do a hard reload here so it actually has to reload everything. You see that it transferred in 2.6 megabytes in 1.93 seconds. I will then do that again with the HTTP2. And you see it finished in 1.5 seconds and transferred 2.6 megabytes of data. So it looks like header compression is bumpkiss. It doesn't look like it did anything. But if we look here at the index.html page that it sent, in HTTP2, it's only 449 bytes, where with 1.1, without header compression, that's 582. So it's actually a pretty significant savings, especially when you start spreading over all of the connections that we saved. So it's not a huge amount per file, but if you think about it from the data center standpoint, you're saving quite a bit of data if you send multiple connections. Next thing I'd like to show you is if I click into one of these things, I see that with the 1.1 protocol, this should be pretty familiar to you. If I view the request headers, I see here's my get slash HTTP 1.1 and all my headers. With HTTP 2, they restructured this a little bit in order to make it easier to deal with programmatically. So there's a lot of information that is encoded on this first line that you have to pick apart. Well, with HTTP 2, they've introduced these pseudo headers that take the method, path, and scheme. So the method, the path, we don't even have the scheme here, as well as the authority, which is the host, and pack that all into these pseudo headers. You don't work with these pseudo headers, that's gonna be created by the server, by the client. You're actually not even permitted to create those. If you do, then that's gonna generate an error in the connection. Also, another thing that I noticed is, you notice that we have Pascal case on our headers here. Well, those are all lowercase now. So that solves a lot of questions and ambiguity about how should we transfer things. I know I ran into issues with that pretty often where what do I capitalize, what don't I? Because we have this weird mix of dashes and uppercase letters. Well, that's now cleared up. Everything's lowercase separated by dashes. If you're too lower stringing everything, that's not going to change. But if you are not, if you're doing exact character matches, you're going to have to be aware of that. And then you notice accept encoding. We have an accept encoding here. Accept language. We have an accept language. All the headers are still there. The responses are going to be the same. That's, there's nothing changed there. Now under the covers, remember this header is one header's frame followed by zero or more continuation frames. The response was contained in data frames and potentially server even sent some trailing headers that would be used by the browser for some internal optimization work. So I think that's pretty interesting. The other thing that I've noticed as I'm looking here, we see a speed up here. This actually, as I've run this several times, sometimes I see a speed up, sometimes I don't really depends on how things are working. Um, I've also noticed that there's a little bit different if I look in the timeline, HTTP 1.1 seems to spend a lot of time stalled. It can only send four connections at a time to the same domain. I assume it's waiting to be able to make that request to the domain. In HTTP 2, I'm seeing, at least on my local, a lot of the time is spent in waiting. And waiting here, as I understand it, is actually waiting for the server to do something with it. So it could be that this is caused by some internal buffering that the server is doing in order to manage the connections. It also could be caused by the fact that we have to remember HTTP2 is doing a lot more work. Since it's got a single connection and it's multiplexing all these streams, it has to remember all of the clients. 
It has to remember all of those streams and have the logic for how to reassemble those streams as well as create the frames and send those. So HTTP2 is actually a much more complicated protocol to implement. There's a lot more that the server or the client have to do in order to work with that. So I think that that might also be part of this. I think that there's some optimization opportunities that over the next few point releases of Go, we might actually see this speed differential get even better. Uh, this is actually about what I'm reading about that people expect 10 to 20 percent or they're observing 10 to 20 percent speed improvements by implementing HTTP2. It looks like we've seen that here. So if you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to leave those down below. As always, if you have any questions and you don't want to use YouTube, you can reach out to me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is down below as well. Okay, well, until next time, y'all take care. Bye.